Hello, my name is Heidi Matson, and I am a discussion group coordinator and a member of the Student Advisory Board here at the Dole Institute. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics and thank you for attending today's program. Discussion groups are made possible by the Newman Zone Foundation and this program is presented in partnership with the Carter Center. We'd like to thank everyone at the, on the Carter Center team with a special thanks to Avery Davis Roberts and Maria Cartaya. Today's program will be live streamed and available on our YouTube channel. You can also access videos of past Dole Institute programs by visiting our YouTube channel at any time. You may, be also, you may also be able to find this session on C-SPAN in the coming days. After the program, we will have some time for audience questions. If you have a question, you please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. For virtual viewers, please send your questions to dolequestions at ku.edu. Please ask just one brief question. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often difficult topics. Please phrase your questions with this in mind and ask just one brief question. <laughs> Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. And now please join me in welcoming former Dole Fellow and editor of the Wall Street Journal, Jerry Seib. Thank you. Um, it's nice to be back in Kansas, back at the Dole Institute, and, and nice to be out of Washington, frankly. It's always <laughs> true. Um, and, and it's nice to be here with these folks, because uh, the size of the turnout here probably uh, is testament to the fact that we have some really interesting and important people here to talk about a really an interesting and important topic. And, um, I want to introduce you to them first, and then we'll launch into it. Um, and in the finest Dole Institute fashion, we have a Republican and a Democrat, and me, neither, so that's good. <laughs> um, uh, Brad Raffensperger, the Secretary of State of Georgia, a Republican, has served as Georgia's Secretary of State since 2019. In that time, he's overseen Georgia public records and Georgia elections, including the highly publicized U.S. Senate runoff elections in 2020 and 2021, and this presidential race in 2020 that you may have read about, <laughs> and that he wrote an entire book about, at least in part. Uh, Brad won re-election himself in 2022 after a contentious Republican primary. He's also the owner of Tendon, is that, I say that right? Systems LLC, a specialty contracting and engineering design firm with nearly 150 employees. Uh, Maggie Toulouse-Oliver, a Democrat, has served as New Mexico's Secretary of State since 2016. As Secretary of State, Oliver uh, has modernized New Mexico elections and advocated for reforms to increase transparency. And Maggie is also the former president of the National Association of Secretaries of State and serves on a number, number of government commissions uh, and civic boards. And please join me in welcoming, him, welcoming both here. <laughs> And I just also wanted to note that Scott Schwab, your Kansas Secretary of State, has also joined us here today. Hey, so thank you. Um, so we, we obviously gather here at a moment when our democracy and its norms and its institutions are under pressure, perhaps more pressure than we've ever witnessed in our lifetimes. We did not have a peaceful transition of power after the 2020 uh, presidential election, which is the hallmark of a healthy democracy. Millions of Americans still don't believe, or at least say they still don't believe, the results of that 2020 presidential election. Uh, a former president actually suggested suspending the Constitution so that he could be returned to office. These are not normal things, and the question is, what do we do to restore the confidence in the integrity of our electoral system? And that's what we're here to talk about today. These two guests are grappling with that question every day on the front lines of democracy. Um, and so I think they have found ways to start answering that question. So one of the ways you guys have found to start answering that question is where I want to start, which is you both signed the Candidate Principles for Trusted Election Statement that was pioneered by the Carter Center about a year ago and has now been picked up by a lot of other organizations. And let me just quickly tell you the principles that are in that statement. Honest process, civil campaigns, secure voting, sorry, responsible oversight, and trusted outcomes. And trusted outcomes in this statement means this, make claims of election irregularities in accordance with the law and acknowledge the legitimacy of outcomes after the results have been certified and all con contestations decided. So let me ask you, East for starters, and Brad, I'll start with you. Why did you decide 
uh, to sign this candidate principles for trusted elections? And did it make a difference for you in your state and your own election? Well, I think that if you're the cook, you ought to be happy with your cooking. And so uh, we have the rules in uh, Georgia, and I wanted everyone to know that we're going to have honest and fair elections. And if I lost, I wasn't going to be belly aching about it. I'd accept it, and I'd maybe come back again or just hang it up and find something else to do. But I think that was really important, and I wanted people to have trust. I understand that it took a major shot after 2020, but we actually really, goes for us, goes back to 2018 when Stacey Abrams lost by 55,000 votes and didn't concede that. That was disruptive at this level. Then when a president, you know, does something, it just ramped it up by, you know, I don't know what power. It was exponential. But I think as people that understand, we trust the process. And this, if the results are calculated, it'll be fair and it'll be accurate. And we'll abide by it. And we expect other candidates to abide by it as well. Maggie? I, I agree with all of that. And I think it was, this was an easy pledge for me to sign because it's already the way I personally, the, the personal values and ethics that I hold about uh, myself personally and, and also engaging in campaigning. And um, so I think, I believe as leaders, we ought to lead by example. Um, so I agree with everything Brad just said. I think that you're gonna find that we do agree on an awful lot. Um, so there, there probably aren't gonna be a whole lot of fireworks between us today, which I think is, is a good thing. <laughs> um, we need more, we need fewer fireworks, not more. Um, but you know, for me too, as a candidate, you know, if I want other people to behave this way, if I want other people to engage in civil discourse in their campaigns, if I want other people to accept election outcomes, and to your point in that pledge, it also talks about, you know, there are legal processes that any candidate um, in any state, and they look a little bit different maybe in every state, but can engage in in order to, you know, if there are legitimate questions about the conduct of an election, if there are legitimate issues that need to be examined by a court, uh, after the fact, et cetera, that can happen. And, and we're not saying nobody can do that, but what we are saying is, you know, the sort of, the just casting a, or painting with a broad brush, oh, this, this election was rigged, you know, it's the, the, elect, the machines are, are rigging the vote, what, whatever, you know, there's so many different versions of, of the same, frankly, lie out there, um, but to not engage in that, and I thought that was really important. Yeah. You know, you both endured plenty of controversy in 2020, obviously. Brad, you got a call from the President of the United States uh, pressuring you to, quote, find 11,870 votes so he could win the state of Georgia, which you write about in some detail in your book. And Maggie, your state was challenged in court by the Trump campaign, even though Joe Biden won by 11 percentage points in New Mexico. Over 100,000 votes, uh, yes. But, but it didn't stop there, because you both faced controversies again in 2022. Brad, Democrats objected to a new election law that was put in place and claimed it was a voter suppression law. Jim Crow 2.0, I think was the phrase. And you, Maggie, there was a conservative county in your state that refused, simply refused to certify the election results because county commissioners thought that the minion voting systems had fixed the vote. I want to ask you both about those, but let me start here with you, Maggie, because um, I'm wondering what those experiences leave you thinking about the current state of the debate. And in particular, Maggie, we saw what happened yesterday in which Dominion uh, voting machines won a $785, $87 million uh, 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 settlement with Fox News because their claims that the Dominion voting systems uh, were rigged turned out not to be true. Question, is, is this debate over Dominion voting systems over now as a result of that uh, settlement or not? I wish. <laughs> I wish it were. I mean, I think this goes a long way. I, I hope that the people who are paying attention and, and I think they're, you know, we use the term election denier, some of us. I, you know, I think there, there are folks who, who have, have trust in our election system, who, who, who deny the truth of the outcome of the 2020 presidential election, election deniers. So I hope those folks who are maybe on the fence and, and gen genuinely curious, genuinely don't know um, because they're hearing things from both sides. I certainly hope that the Dominion settlement goes a long way because part of that settlement is not just Fox paying out, uh, you know, three quarters of a billion dollars uh, to a private company. It's the admission that they knowingly spread lies about the systems that both of our states use uh, to conduct elections. Um, that being said, unfortunately, I think that this notion um, that the election in 2020 was rigged and that our elections are not to be trusted has taken such deep root 
with a certain part of our population that it, it, it is going to take much more than that, unfortunately. And I don't know what, we, we have these conversations a lot, what will it take to get folks back on the side of trusting our election process? That, that is exactly what we are trying to figure out every single day. And, and Brad, you know, you, the voting in Georgia in 2022 appeared to come off very smoothly. Mm -hmm. um, Democrats did quite well. They hung onto that Senate seat. Um, but you still face charges that the new election law in your state was suppressing votes. What, what's your response? How are you answering people who continue to question um, whether Georgia is doing it right? Well, we think we are doing it right. Uh, I was telling the students back there that probably all the good stuff you like is stuff that we wrote in our office, but we just had to keep a low profile because if that got out, then they probably would not vote for it because at that time my name was Mud. <laughs> but we wanted to make sure that we had some uh, changes and updates to the law. Number one is we now have photo ID for any form of voting in Georgia. We've had photo ID for in-person voting for probably about 15 years now. But now if you want to vote absentee, we do it through a driver's license number. We're, we're real ID compliant, so that's photo ID. Now, when I talk to my bipartisan rotary group, I can, I can be honest with them. I might tell them, we actually copied Minnesota. You know, and because Minnesota's on the left side of the aisle. But when I talk to other, uh, the, the Tea Party groups, Republican groups, I tell them, I say Minnesota and Nebraska, and I'll throw in <laughs> Kansas. So they know that, okay, we got both. And then I say Texas even copied us. But what people don't realize, we had been sued by both Republican Party and Democrats on signature match because they said it's subjective. Well, I'm an engineer. I think they're right. And so we <laughs> said, let's take that off the table. We will use objective criteria. And so that's really important. We're also a member of ERIC, the Electronic Registration Information Center, which was not part of that. But now it's taking some shots from people. But we can update our voter rolls objectively because we don't pull people off by saying that they don't live here anymore, we find out that they actually have moved to another state that's a member of ERIC. So it lets us have cleaner you know, voter lists, and we think that's important. We added a day of early voting. We have two Saturdays of early voting. And what we found on those, those second Saturday, you know who was voting on there? Middle-class people with middle-class jobs, people that couldn't get off Monday to Friday, and so they could then come out and vote Saturday. We thought that was a great thing. And so we had record turnout, we have record registrations, and we had record participation. And now we just followed that up this year with our General Assembly. We now have mandated by law that you can get time off to vote if you want to vote early. And why that's so important for us in Georgia is that we don't have 65% of our voters are voting early with 17 days. About 30% then are voting on election day, and about 5 or 6% are voting no excuse absentee voting. So people like to vote in person in Georgia, and so that's our preference. Other states have different preferences, but we give you lots of options, but we want you to know we're going to have honest and fair elections, and just like that line that goes right down there, every county election director, they're charged with doing their job. Don't look left, don't look right, just do your job, follow the law, follow the Constitution. It's the candidate's job to win elections. That's not our job. Our job is to follow the law. But let me draw you out, Maggie, on this, because you don't have voter ID in your state, correct? We don't require a uh, government-issued photo ID in person to vote, no. So is Georgia wrong to do that? No, I, you know, I think, I, I think a lot of times, as chief election officials, folks like to draw us into this debate mm -hmm. and, and make us sort of pick on each other. You mean and guys say, like me is what you mean, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't see I don't see you doing that. <laughs> okay. So that's excellent. Um, you know, because it's it's one of those hot button issues, right? It's it's what we call a wedge issue in American politics, right? So, you know, let's let's get people on either side of this this wedge and, and try to force it. Um, if if it works, you know, for me philosophically, my bottom line is are is, is it a barrier to participation? Are people able to vote? under the system, and if it works in Georgia, then that's great. You know, in my state, we don't see it as a, we see it as a solution to a problem we're not seeing. We, we, don't, we don't have the same kind of, you know, subjectivity challenges that Secretary Raffensperger was talking about. We don't see a rash of people trying to impersonate others at the polls. In fact, it's an incredibly um, 
high risk, low reward act to, to get charged with a felony on the odd chance that the one vote that you cast is actually going to change the outcome of the election. That being said, um, you know, what works in a state is, and we're seeing robust participation and look at all the other things, you know, Georgia is doing. Um, to, to really encourage that voter participation and make it easy for folks to vote. And I, th I think that's a great thing. Yeah. Um, you know, Brad, I was going to follow up on one thing you mentioned, which is the Stacey Abrams precedent. And you, mm -hmm. you talk about this in the book, that that's where this started in Georgia to some extent. Um, is this really a bipartisan problem, this idea that I'm not going to accept the results of the election if I'm not happy with them? Uh, or is it really mostly a problem in your party, frankly, and Stacey Abrams is the outlier? Well, I think that you've seen it on both sides of the aisle. But like I said, when the President of the United yeah. States of America, the most powerful position, elected position we have in this country, and then we are the world leader, and so it's the most powerful position in the, in the world, uh, they can ramp things up to a whole different level. And when they have 80 million Twitter followers, and we had about 40,000, maybe 45,000 on a good day, it's tough to compete against that. We felt like the Swiss Army, you know, going up against the best of the American military. You know, you may be good, but, you know, they can just swamp the boat. And so that's kind of the issues that you have. It was just at a whole different level. But it's not based on honesty. And that's, at the end of the day, it's, it's a core issue is basic honesty, integrity, character. And those are Kansas values. And those are American values. Those are Western Pennsylvania values because those are my dad's values. And those are Georgia values. Those are American values. Those are just eternal values. And we need to you know, get, the, get the train back on the tracks with those values. And once we have the value systems in place and we won't tolerate people deviating from the norm, then I think things are going to work out. But I think until we really figure that part out, mm -hmm. I think that we're whistling in the wind. Well, but I, I want to go there because the, the broader question that hangs over this isn't what you went through in 2020 or 2022, but how do you get the train back on the tracks? How do we get past this moment and take the question off the table? What, is, what steps do, do the United oh, States of America need? I, it's these people right here. Yes. Yeah. The voters need to hold people that run for office accountable and say, we won't put up with that. That's right. And you just don't vote for them. And you expect a certain standard. And so that really gets back to right. accountability, and the voters do figure it out. So I've never doubted the goodness of my fellow Georgians, and I bet you, you know, Scott here, he never doubts the goodness of his, the average Kansans because people are good just about all over the country. I've never gone to a place with my wife that we just said, these are nice people here. And so Americans are just great people. They're good, honest, decent people, and they won't put up with it. So don't put up with it. Expect a higher standard. Thank Paul you. writes about that in his book in Titus, about what he expects of the overseers and the community. And that's what you need to be demanding for who holds office, from city council to the state house to the president of the United States of America. And, and I think the good news is that we, we saw that in 2022, right? Brad was reelected in Georgia, mm -hmm. right? Uh, which was awesome. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I ran against uh, an election denier in my state, and I was reelected, right? A around the country, thank you. <laughs> a a a a yeah, Scott, oh my gosh, you have what that fun primary too, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so look, I mean, for the most part, I mean, there, there, you know, there are some exceptions out there, right? And we still do, I mean, there, there's a vocal minority um, that are in elected office. Yeah. Um, that are still continuing to perpetuate um, the myth that the 2020 election was rigged or stolen or something like but what, that. But that's the question. Why does that persist? I mean, if you took a poll, we've done it at the Wall Street Journal. I'm still part of the Wall Street Journal polling operation. You still have a significant share of Americans, mostly almost entirely in the Republican Party, who say it wasn't fairly decided. How does that continue? And what do you do to turn that around, if anything? I mean, I think it's a couple of things. I think it's, first of all, it's time, right? I mean, if you, if you look at any rough patch in American history, we have managed to collectively get through it. And it doesn't mean that it was pretty in the process. Um, but we have managed to collectively get through it with time, with intentionality. Yeah. So a lot of the things our states are doing, the, the voter reform uh, work that, that Brad did in Georgia, the work we're doing in my state, if you look around at other states, they're, they're 
they're all doing more to increase the level of transparency in the process. One of the things that we're doing is we're encouraging folks, especially those who have questions or doubts about the election process, to get more involved, to serve as poll workers, to work you know, temporary jobs, to, to even just be an observer for a day at your polling location on behalf of a political party or nonpartisan group like Common Cause. So I think the more that we're able to integrate folks and really bring them in, uh, and also do these things like post-election audits, uh, things that are done to verify and double check. I mean, gosh, in Georgia, you guys did three, I think, full hand recounts of the 2020 ballots or something like that. Um, you know, both, both a complete recount and then the audit. The more of those things we can do, I hope that the, really the hurt, the bad feelings and that's where I think it really stems from, right? Just people being really unhappy with the outcome. And to Brad's point, you know, the fact that you've got this incredibly loud megaphone, right, that has just continued to, to, to bring up those hurt feelings over and over and over and over and over again. If we can kind of get past the point in time where that's happening on a daily basis, and, and we are getting there. It's just, it's slow and we're in the middle of it and it's hard to see. It's hard to see where we end up yeah. right now. If you had to pick a couple of things, Brad, that could be done to get past this moment and back on the tracks, not in Georgia, but around the country, what would those be? I don't know if I have a quick and easy answer on that. But I think <laughs> I just you. really laid it all out. It gets back to the individual character that you're looking at from the candidate in themselves. But we do encourage the transparency is very important. And one of the challenges we had with the, our county election directors is they're so honest and they just don't understand why do I have to have all this transparency? I, of course I'm honest. I know you're honest. Everyone knows you're honest. But there's not a lot of trust out there. So it's like make sure you know that you don't have sheetrock on those walls, that they're actually glass walls. Let people yeah. look in on the process and encourage people to become poll workers. The number one thing that we need are more poll workers all the time. Right. And it really wants you to work through the process. So it's really engage more people in the process. But then also is I go out and I talk all the time to you know community groups. I've been, you know, I was in South Georgia early uh, in the week, also in North Georgia, talking one to a chamber group, the other one to rotary groups, but community groups. And just really getting the message out, taking questions from anyone every, anywhere, just like we'll do here tonight. And if you really take people's questions and then you respond to them, don't blow them off and give them a respectful answer, they have the answer. They may not like what you said because mm -hmm. of what's in the answer, but they do have but the do, answer. Are they listening? Yeah, I think by and large, uh, you know, I've, I went to a tea party meeting in North Georgia and for one hour lunch and I was there for like an hour and 45 minutes. <laughs> and one of the ladies, what she wanted, she wanted a receipt. And I thought, well, we, when we do with a paper ballot, it doesn't mean you get a receipt because the ballot stays in the ballot box. Right. The reason you don't get the receipt is so you, it stops your vote buying. And she exactly. didn't really understand that. But I understood where she, she was expecting that. But she didn't still like that answer. But at least I addressed it with her. It doesn't mean she has to like it. But I'm just going to have an honest conversation with yeah. her. And she had an honest one with me. Yeah. You know, you, you mentioned the need for more poll workers, um, which I, I get. There's also another factor in this equation we haven't touched on yet, um, which is the intimidation of people who work on elections. Intimidation of people like you, and you, I know you each have your own horror stories about intimidation and threats you've gotten. That filters all the way down to poll workers. So uh, two questions for each of you. Um, how big a problem is that in terms of getting people to work on elections so they run smoothly and, and can be efficient? And secondly, what can be done to stop intimidation of people who do what you guys do and what the people who work for you do, which is to try to run honest elections? What, what can be done? First of all, how big a problem is it? I mean, I think it's a real problem. I think in a place, you know, we, there, there were some very public, um, really bad uh, intimidation issues with folks in, in Georgia mm -hmm. and in, in really the, those battleground states uh, throughout the country that we saw in 2020, which, which by the way, newsflash, are going to be the same battleground mm -hmm. states uh, in 2024, more than likely. Um, so we didn't have those issues as much during the course of the election or in the immediate aftermath of the election in my state as they did in Georgia and places like Nevada and Michigan, Pennsylvania. 
Ohio, or not Ohio anymore. Ohio's not a no, it's battleground not a state, state anymore. anymore. But you can tell my brain is still in uh, 20 years ago. But anyway, um, so I think it's a big issue. I think it's situational. But I am naturally concerned about the folks that are working the polls and, and that are staff and that are volunteers at the county level in my state. And so we just passed a, a bill in my state um, to sort of answer the second part of your question uh, that uh, really increases the, the penalties for intimidation, harassment, and threats of violence against anybody who is working an election, whether it be the Secretary of State down to, uh, you know, somebody who works the polls maybe just one day, uh, because we, we are hopeful that that will, you know, really discourage <laughs> the, the behavior uh, from getting any worse. Well, obviously we've had uh, intimidation of our election workers in Georgia. Uh, I guess Ruby Freeman and you know, mother-daughter uh, team that you saw in Fulton County, and then also a gentleman that was working in Gwinnett County, and that's really when Gabriel Sterling, you know, our chief operating officer, uh, probably had the speech of all speeches when he uh, went to the podium, and he was just, you know, basically spoke with a lot of passion, and I was just so proud of what he said. Um, behaved himself. I, I'm glad I didn't do it because I'm a contractor and I don't know what I would have said. But, uh, <laughs> but he just said what needed to be said, called people out. If you want to lead, lead and lead appropriately. And so it has been an issue. We even had in Bartow County, which is an 80-20 county, some of the poll workers were followed home. It was an 80% President Trump county. And that doesn't make sense. And so <laughs> we had that type of thing. I do believe that there should be additional penalties for anyone that threatens poll workers, election workers, because if you think about it, I don't know what they pay here in Kansas, maybe we need to get their pay up here, Scott, <laughs> but it's about, it's it's like $150, you know, it, it's a nominal amount of money, yeah. you know, per day, you know, some, some counties can only afford $110, yeah. so it truly is public service, yes. and so they're doing this, uh, many of the people are retired, and this is like something to give back to their communities. And that is to be rewarded and esteemed and really just, you know, elevated. Mm -hmm. And so I think there should be additional penalties. So, but in, in that period be, between 2020 and 2022, given how much the intimidation was publicized in Georgia, yeah. did you have a fall off in people who were willing to do this we, work? We still actually filled, you know, we had enough people. And that was just really the county's worked very hard on That's recruitment. Right. And so I was really proud of the effort of our county election directors. And we've been coming along, our counties run elections, just like they do in most other states. So we've been coming alongside of our election directors to give them that support, moral support, you know, pat on the back, just to encourage them to continue to do the great work that they do. And do you think, do you think there is more that could be done nationally on this front, or is this really a state issue? I don't like the, fed, uh, the idea of federal takeover of elections. But I do think that we should have poll worker protections. At, at a federal level? Well, if the states won't do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And you? I, I uh, just agreed today to sign on to a piece of bipartisan piece of legislation that's co-sponsored uh, by Senator Klobuchar, Minnesota. We're talking about Minnesota a lot here today. Mm. Um, the Federal Election Protection Worker Act, and you know, I don't know what its chances are, but I, you know, I, I agree. I think um, you know when it comes to you know, threatening election officials that are engaged in conducting federal elections, um, there, I think it is appropriate to have federal penalties uh, for that behavior. You, 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 you would agree with that? If uh, the I, think, state I think that we need to make sure that there are penalties so that yeah. it's a deterrent. Yeah. Because these people that have volunteered to be a poll worker also take an oath of office. They're putting their hand and they're swearing that they'll be faithful to the Constitution right. of their state and to the United States Constitution. And so it's really like jury duty. It's like being almost like a law enforcement officer. I think that there's certain positions should be protected against any type of inc coercion or intimidation. Yeah. So let's look forward a little bit. I mean, you've both been through two elections in 2020 and 2022, which were conducted in this kind of pressure cooker environment that we've been talking about. There's another one in 2024. Um, what uh, elements of this uh, pressure cooker that we've been talking about uh, do you think or fear will still be there in 2024, and which ones do you think maybe we've gotten past? Maybe, maybe you can start, Maggie. I'll start with the positive. I mean, God willing, we will not be conducting an election during a roaring pandemic um, that, you know, not only had the public health implications that it had, but just, you know, created such a, you know, uh, toxic polarization. You know, I, I, who I... 
call me naive, and I guess I am, but I never would have thought, you know, that a, that a public health crisis would have created the the political, you know, partisanship that it did. But um, so hopefully we don't have that factor to try to operate under. And a lot of I think the challenges and the issues that arose out of 2020 arose out of the fact that states were locked down, that people were in their homes, that people were closing their businesses, right? I mean, there was just so much emotion and tension going on. Um, so that, I think, is going to be a pressure valve, you know, release valve on some of the challenges that we had in 2020. However, the, the effect of the lies and the mis and disinformation that were spread about the, the outcome of the 2020 election, they have taken, I think, even deeper root at a local level. So we may not even see the exact same playbook uh, on the national level in terms of just sort of calling an election rigged. But now we have these homegrown, like in my state, we have this homegrown organization that's sort of going around to all the local uh, county officials and saying, you know, your, your machines aren't, you know, counting things correctly. You know, this election is rigged, and so dredging up new let, stuff. Let me draw you on that. Who's, who is doing that exactly? <laughs> we have a local uh, homegrown uh, pair of activists uh, uh, that have sort of just decided that they're election experts, and the, uh, one of them is an engineer. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but isn't it, un, unlike our engineer here on the stage, isn't isn't actually an election expert? Has just sort of self-declared, <laughs> right? And so they're you know they're going around and they're making graphs and you know creating charts that look you mm. know very legitimate and you know trying to sort of. You know, it's sort of a traveling road show yeah. uh, of, you know, our elections aren't valid. And so, I mean, in states like mine, and, and, and mine isn't the only state that's dealing with this type of kind of, like I say, homegrown situation. Yeah. It's going to have its, its own flavor everywhere. And are they um, being believed as they do the road show? In some places, yes. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned Otero County. Yeah. You know, the county that l last summer refused to certify their election. That, that was sort of their, that was their high point. And, you know, that was one of the first counties mm -hmm. they hit and raised these questions and issues, and then look what happened. Well, is Otero County going to be using Dominion voting machines again? Yes, they are. <laughs> Every voting system in New Mexico is a Dominion voting right. system, and it oh, will still same be. with us. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. There you yes. How timely yes. that you're here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Wonder why they picked us. <laughs> You don't get a share of the settlement, though, right? Yeah. I was going to say we should all get free voting machines, you know? <laughs> like, wouldn't that be nice? Uh, talk a little bit, Brad, about what you think, what's going to carry forward and still be problematic in 2024, and what have we maybe left on the roadside between 2020 and now? Well, from the standpoint of this was an off year for us, so legislatively, our law is pretty much fixed for next year. Yeah. I don't know if there, you could do anything of any major sorts. We're, we know what next year looks like from the standpoint of the law. One of the things that's a practical matter, we use ballot marking devices, so you actually make your selections and then it prints out a ballot. So we just want to get the 30-pound battery packs instead of the 80-pound, just makes it better and easier for election workers. But we want to make sure the counties will be prepared for the, uh, we expect we had 5 million in 2020. We expect that it'll be more than that. Mm. People are just engaged in the process. We're seeing percentage of voter participation going up every cycle for the last 10 to 12 years now. So we're seeing that. So we just want to prepare the counties and look at the precinct side. How many machines do you have? So the throughput that we get keep the line short because by state law, lines have to be shorter than one hour. And we think that's a good thing. So we'll be working on that to just have a smooth process. Yeah. So let me throw out an idea that, that I've suggested in columns a couple of times. As far as I know, nobody else has taken me up on it, but maybe you guys will. But um, do you think it would be possible for the two political parties to produce jointly um, a kind of set of best practices for conducting elections? Now, elections are state, there are 50, 50 election systems state by state in this country, and I get that. But what if there were a set of best practices that both parties agreed upon that would at least maybe start to take this question of election integrity off the table? And I say this because maybe I'm naive, and your look on your face suggests you think I'm naive. But, uh, no, no. But, I mean, it is a fact that every elected official in the country derives his or her legitimacy from this very system. So why wouldn't they have an interest uh, in uh, nailing down the integrity of that system? Because it serves their own integrity. I think there are a number of us who would be more than willing to come to the table and have that kind of a conversation. Um, I think it would 
have, it would just out of necessity have to be extremely broad. And I think it really is going to end up, you know, if we do end up doing such a thing, which I don't, I would never call you naive. I just think that, <laughs> you know, I know like the three of us and we have some other colleagues, um, you know, that, that we can have these conversations and we, you know, we can come to the table together. Unfortunately, there, there are other colleagues on both sides that are, they're not in that space. Yeah. They don't want to do that. Um, it just for, po for political reasons. And, um, you know, they may even sort of know, like, yeah, this would be a good idea, but for political reasons, they won't come to the table. So I don't think that's possible, but I think if anything were to come of it, I think just some, you know, kind of going back to the, the, the Carter Center pledge, yeah. right? You know, that, that may be a place where we can have some increased participation and, and some increased, um, you know, bipartisan agreement. Well, but to your point, when we had the Carter-Baker Commission, many people aren't aware of that, but President Jimmy Carter sat down with former Secretary of State James Baker, and so now you have the Carter-Baker uh, you know, centers, and uh, they, they get together and do talk about this, but they, they issued a report, bipartisan report, and they said, this is all the things we agree on, and then they said, and this is what I think, and this is what I, so they didn't agree on some of the issues. But they brought in people from both sides of the aisle. So they brought in state reps. They brought in U.S. you know representatives, U.S. senators, secretaries of state. But uh, and then research, what is the best practice? And so you could talk about photo ID, or talk about no excuse after the vote, talk about mail-in voting. But it developed a template for best practices. So we're here is what we agree on. Here's what we don't agree on, but they did it in a way that was very respectful. And then you have to understand that you do have mail-in states. So those are primarily the West Coast states plus Utah and a few others. And then other states do things a little bit different. So I think it's almost at a point from the 2005 or 2006 presidential mm -hmm. uh, bipartisan commission, maybe we need a 2020 for 2025, but it'll probably be after 24. But to have bring people together, because it'll take a couple years to really jawbone on this That's and right. work and grind mm -hmm. to get something that we can both, you know, say this is the body of the report we agree on, and then we'll have things we just have differences of preferences. <laughs> Respectful we'll call it that. disagreement. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. like President Carter did with Secretary of State Baker. Yeah, yeah, I love that yeah idea. that's a good point. Uh, I I just have a couple more questions, then I'm going to open it up to to, to these folks. Um, but you mentioned, I think, Maggie, the, the COVID, the pandemic. Yeah. And I've always thought that, uh, as you suggested, the, the pandemic, which either compelled or at least um, uh, sort of pushed states to change the rules on the fly a little bit, was one of the reasons that there was so much anxiety about whether the rules were being followed in 2020, because they did kind of change on the run a little bit. That's the correct. The flip side of that, though, is I, I have this feeling, but you guys are the pros, that because of that experience, we'll never go back to voting the same way that we did when I was first 18 and voted once. And we'll never go back to everybody's got to vote on election day and everybody's got to vote in person and you have to have an extreme excuse to get an absentee ballot. Are those days gone forever and that's one of the reasons we're in this new frontier that we're talking about? Yeah, I think the genie, the genie came out of the bottle. And you know the other the other byproduct of 2020 and the pandemic was that uh, we saw massive participation in the yeah. election on a level that we'd never seen. And then we basically saw the the midterm election uh, counterpart to that in 22, right? So just tons of people uh, because you love the president, because you hated the president, because you love what your state government was doing or your local government or you hated it. We're turning out in record numbers and are turning out in record numbers. And the reality is, and I will tell you, I, I spent 10 years as a local election official running elections in the largest jurisdiction in New Mexico. So I know this firsthand. Um, you cannot, in, in today's environment, you cannot conduct a single day of voting from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. in in-person polling places and accommodate all of the voters mm. in your state anymore. You just cannot do that. Um, so I, I do think that, uh, you know, some of the changes that were made to, and you know, make it easier uh, for folks to vote by mail, make it easier to vote in person, you know, the expanded early voting that Brad was talking about they're doing in Georgia and um, making, a, <laughs> making it easier to count accurately your absentee ballots and things like that, right? I do think those things are, are going to be permanent changes. So no, no going back? Well, in Georgia, we actually didn't change anything. Mm. All those laws were in place. We had no excuse absentee voting in place since 2005. Yeah. It's put into law by 
Governor Sonny Perdue, who the first Republican, mm. you know, governor that we had. So it was pretty <laughs> irony of ironies. Ir irony <laughs> of, so there it was. Yeah. The only thing that when we had a state of emergency, what we did is we sent out absentee ballot applications for the first primary, and the reason we did that was so it was a uniform process. Everyone got one that was an active voter, so that the political parties wouldn't swamp the boat. Campaigns would have swamped. So you would have had four or five at your house. Send them all back in because you didn't think it hurt anything. And the county only had one person working there, two people, because they were really down on staff. But that's that's the only thing we did. We kept all three options open so people could vote, and then obviously the numbers were higher. So what's really changed in Georgia is so, the option people choose to exercise. Right, right. exactly. Right. But and so in the first primary, we had 35 to 40 percent of the people voted absentee. Come in the fall, it was down to about 20 percent. Already had dropped because people felt more comfortable. Yeah. But that was their own free will choice. Yeah. So I don't think, uh, I just think next year will be uh, more of the same, but we, we, people know what to expect now. Yeah. So let me ask my final question. It's a very general one, but having been through these, uh, these wars, are you confident or pessimistic about the state and the fate of our democracy? Let me ask you to go first. <laughs> I'm very confident because I'm just confident in people. Because at the end of the day, I read the end of the book, and I know that the good always wins. And I just believe that more people are good than aren't. And so I just lean into Luke Bryan. He's from Georgia, so most people are good. And I just think also another Tim McGraw, country and western song, but be humble and kind. And I think if you're humble and kind and you're, you know, just, you know, lean into the good, it's all going to work out. But I also understand that right now we're going through this economic disruption uh, we have a political cycle that's ending. It's the very end of the Reagan cycle. So people are looking for what's the leadership. And both political parties, I think, are looking for that next generation leader. And both political parties haven't found that yet. And as a Republican, I hope we do. But <laughs> I know that that's going on. Then economically, we're coming out of this cycle looking for the next cycle. Who knows what that'll look like? And so that just creates a lot of social stress. I understand we are polarized. Yeah. But I'm really hopeful about America because sometimes we doubt ourselves, but we never need to doubt ourselves. It's a great country with great people, and we'll get through this, and we'll get through this together. I think it's a good point because people lose sight of the fact that the country is very, not only bitterly divided, but evenly divided. It's a 50-50 country, and that That's creates right. a lot of pressure in and of itself on mm -hmm. the system. But and, I, and I think that that is a, a, a perfect point to dovetail on, which is that by necessity, uh, you know, we, we can either we can either fight each other or we can work together, right? And I think there's a lot of fighting of each other going on, and I really do think that a lot of the conditions that Brad just talked about, you know, this, this sort of transitional place that we're in as a nation, the economic stretch, stresses, the, the post-COVID sort of realities that we're all um, dealing with, I think are, are making it particularly hard. It's a hard time. It's been a hard time the last few years in America. I think we need to acknowledge that. And yet we are still, we're still together. We're not, you know, we're not having the easiest time of it. You know, there's a lot of fighting, a lot of arguing, a lot of lies and mis and disinformation. It's like a, kind of like a bad marriage. Um, <laughs> now that I think about it. Uh, but, but look, you know, I agree with Brad, and this is the thing, right? We, we, we agree on so much more than we disagree on. Mm. And we are so much more like each and every one of us as individuals than we are different from each other as Americans. I also, I, I, am, I am the eternal optimist. I get pessimistic at times, but I also believe in this country. I also believe in our collective ability to get through these hard times and get out on the other side. And do you know why? Because we have done it before. We have done it before, and we can do it again, and it's just really hard right now. So you're telling us this is a phase, and it will pass. I, I hope this is the teenage years. Yeah, <laughs> I do. I do. There are those who never got out of the teenage years. I'm just, <laughs> just noting. Um, all right, I want to open it up to you. I'll repeat the, uh, the ground rules that Heidi so uh, aptly uh, described at the outset here, which is, um, there'll be a couple of students with microphones. Uh, raise your hand and I'll call on you. Wait till the microphone gets to you. Um, stand up if you could so everybody can see. Uh, as a reminder that a question is a question that has a question mark at the end. It's different from a speech. Um, and um, please keep in mind the uh, tradition of uh, civility and, and respect that the Dole Institute stands for. So who wants to get started? Right there.
Thank you. Uh, really appreciate you being here. And I, too, agree that I think we've got a good election system in this country. There's some things that are not good uh, about it. So first, an opinion, a part of, part of, I think, the problem is our primary system. It's designed to make the extremes in either party. I don't care whether you're Republican or Democrat. The primary system is, is kind of designed to work in favor of the radicals. Pick a side, I don't care. What can you, as Secretary of State, do to help change that system to make that more reflective of what the people want rather than what the radicals want? Uh, I'll, I'll start with that because it's actually something I think about a lot. I think that's a fair point. Um, and every state's a little bit different in terms of how they conduct their primaries. In my state, we are one of the last vestiges of the, the quote-unquote closed primary, so we don't allow folks to vote in our primaries that are not registered members of that political party. And I have for years been arguing that we need to open them up because there, in particular, there are so many races where the ultimate outcome is decided in the primary. Jerry, you and I were talking about this earlier because you know a district is so heavily one party or the other that that is really where the only choice lies. So I think that's at least one thing that we can do is start opening up and bringing more participation into our primary elections. Well, fortunately, Georgia is actually what's called an open primary state, Lucky. which means you can just you know show up and vote. And after I won my primary without a runoff, you know, some people were fussing about that, and they said, well, he won because Democrats support. That's not true. I, I run with Republican, but I also my numbers were even higher because if you look at what I did is I started reshoring back lost Republicans. And so just like I believe manufacturing needs to come back to America, I think Republicans need to come back home. And we were losing them over the last cycle, and it really started around 14, then 16, then 18, bit by bit. And I have a friend, and I lost him, you know, probably, I think it was 18 sometime, he, he started voting on the other side, but his wife a couple years sooner. But you started bringing people back, and so I'm not afraid of having open primaries because I want to have a message that is going to broaden our party because elections are all about expanding your base. When you become a statewide elected official, once you have you know, that charge, your job is to actually grow the base. Yes, you're, you have your political leaning, but you also want more people to think, I like the way that person leans that way. I never thought I might be a Republican. And bit by bit, Reagan did. Other people have done it. Likewise, they probably have done it on their side, and I'll let them worry about their politics. I'll worry <laughs> about mine on that. But I believe in the open primaries really helps that so that people have just an opportunity to, to vote for the person they think is the best person you know, that represent those values in that position. I'm, I'm curious, are either of you fans of ranked choice primaries, which is when voters list their order of preference, or jungle primaries in which everybody runs in the same primary regardless of party? I, I will say I'm, I'm ranked choice curious, and I am supportive of it um, <laughs> at, a, at a local level in our nonpartisan races in my state. In fact, we do, and I'm trying to encourage more municipalities because, you know, in the, the nonpartisan races in particular, you know, we had a, a, a city in New Mexico where 10 people ran for mayor on the same ballot, right? And so you were gonna end up with somebody winning with, you know, potentially like 11% of the total mm -hmm. vote, right? Something like that. So, um, you know, I think it's interesting. You know, I think there is also an argument to be made in, in states where you do have like single party dominance that, you know, you're not necessarily expanding, you know, the options to voters when you do a jungle primary yeah. or something like that. That's actually we looked at and considered right now. Georgia is a runoff state, and I am the world record holder of runoffs. <laughs> I've had four of them. Uh, and so... Uh, and you, and you but, loved every one, I think. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, the counties... They would like us to do away with runoffs because they just wear them out. Yeah. You know, come they, November, they then flow right after Thanksgiving, and so they're saying we don't really care how we're not going to tell you how to do your job, General Assembly. But so the General Assembly is kind of digging into that, so I'll let them do their work. Yeah. Okay. Uh, will you have one back there, and then we'll go here next. Okay. Hi. Uh, I have uh, a two-part question for Secretary Raffensperger on concrete actions and words. So you say. You're proud of adding the second Saturday voting, and yes, that was a great part of that law, but weren't you the one who uh, half a year ago issued a guidance which tried to prohibit it in this runoff, which was later blocked in court? I'm sorry, which was later blocked in court. So did you change your mind? 
And second is you said accountability is important and you testified before Fulton County Grand Jury. But many of your colleagues, including Senator Graham and Governor Kemp, try to fight their subpoenas. Do you think they're wrong and uh, hurting accountability? Okay. Can I get that first question again? It was about the guidance, uh, which you tr in November you said that because of Thanksgiving, there shouldn't be a voting uh, on correct. the Saturday after it, yeah. and it was later blocked in court. Yeah, the Attorney General uh, had an opinion that whenever we have a question of law, we go out to the Department of Laws, which is the Attorney General. And what he said is that we had a, a state holiday the Friday after Thanksgiving, and you can't have election following a, a holiday. So it's really, we were already blocked, according to the Attorney General. So that'd be Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And so we followed, you know, the attorney general's guidance. So it went to the court, and uh, then the judge made a ruling, and he said otherwise. And so that's now settled law, and we followed the law. Okay. Uh, to the second part. Subpoenas. Uh, subpoenas. When I'm subpoenaed, I show up. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <clears throat> admittedly, it uh, gives security challenges, but where are we from uh, internet voting? Mm. <laughs> wow. Well, because of all the lawsuits we had from the Stacey Abrams camp, we had a lot of law lawsuit cases, and I was talking to a professor about that one day. I think he went uh, from uh, Pennsylvania University, I forget which one, Pittsburgh, but anyway, he was a subject matter expert, and I asked him that question, and he looked at me, and he said, Brad, it won't happen while we're still doing our jobs. But as soon as we age out, and this man was in his 70s, and I'm hey, give me a break here, buddy. But, <laughs> but anyway, uh, what he was really saying, the younger generation, you know, the people that are under 30, he says, that's how they've lived their whole life, and they're just not going to put up with it. He said, but we don't have the security protocols in place yet. So he thought it was probably like 10 years or somewhere in that range. But it will happen once you have the security protocols in place. I, I agree. We're, we're, we're not there yet. And I think the, the preface to your question, admittedly, there's security challenges. That is, the, that is the crux of the issue. And I think at the end of the day, you know, um, Brad talked about how, you know, they're a 100% paper ballot state in Georgia. I'm a 100% paper ballot state in my state. You know, the, it's a low tech solution to modern challenges and problems with elections, which is that, you know, if you don't trust the outcome of the election, you can always go back to that paper record, right? That, that physical, you can hold it in your hand, you can look at it with your human eye, you're not, you're not trying to read code and, you know, guess whether it has vulnerabilities and whether it could be hacked or, you know, whether a vote could be changed, right? It's right there in front of your face. So I think, um, you know, there may be some options coming down the pike and, and to the extent that they are used, I think that, the, that it's gonna probably be pretty, um, pretty minimal at first, you know, overseas and military voters, you know, folks like actually, you know, underway on a submarine for, you know, days on end, months on end, right? Those kind of folks that we can try that with first because there are gonna be folks that do need those options, but not yet. Good question. Yeah. Others? Right here. Hold on a second. She's coming. I'm a, okay. I'm a little nervous about speaking because there, everybody in the room probably knows more about elections than I do. But in Kansas, a couple of years ago, it's my understanding that uh, a law was passed or there was an opinion put forth that um, uh, made it a felony to impersonate an election official. It has had a, a very chilling effect. The League of Women Voters doesn't do um, uh, voter registration drives in the community and others, uh, groups that would like to do that have been discouraged from doing that. Are you familiar with that and what is your opinion of a law like that? Since I'm not familiar with it, yeah, and sure. I'm going to stay in my engineering lane on that one, uh, yeah. but I'm going to let the Secretary of State of Kansas yeah. put him on the yeah, hot seat let, right let's there. Let's let Scott <laughs> answer that one. <laughs> I didn't expect the state tonight. Um, Sorry to hijack your show. I said I wouldn't do this. <laughs> um, in Kansas, the, we introduced a bill to update some laws on security, like uh, we regulate poll books and things just to make sure everybody's using the consistent 
system. On the floor of the Senate, a senator put on an amendment saying you cannot act like you're the Secretary of State, so I am not breaking the law right now. <laughs> you two. <laughs> um, two, it said you can't impersonate uh, an election worker, and that is in federal court. Well, when there's an election law, whether I wanted the law or not, according to statute, I have to be sued. And so that is currently being litigated in, in court, and I, or in state court, I think. I've got like four lawsuits on this, on this bill because, and, I'm, and they're all the provisions that I'm like, how did that get in there? Um, but that, that's kind of where all that has come from is that legislators come up with ideas and they get stuck in the bill and the governor signs them and I get sued. <laughs> so. And it's not settled law is what you're saying? It is not yet. Okay. Yeah. Others? Right there, Heidi. <laughs> Glad we had you here, Scott. <laughs> I believe so. Uh, and I've always, I mean, let me just caveat that by saying, like, I'm, I'm a weirdo. I mean, I, I was watching presidential debates when I was, like, eight years old. Um, may, may have had something to do with why I do what I do for a living. I don't know. You can be the judge of that. Um, but I absolutely do. And, and I, think, I think that, you know, and, and you're, you're a, a reporter. I mean, you work for media institutions. And I think we see data after every presidential debate that shows the needle gets moved. It does. Yeah. yeah. I agree. I think there should be more debates than they really have. Because when you have just two debates, what can you really cover? Probably one of the most important things that the President of the United States really is responsible for is foreign affairs, military, defense of our nation because that's right in the original Constitution. And we really don't have talked about that. We've been talking about other issues. And then obviously, I think we need to talk about middle class values. What are we gonna do about where the middle class is right now? Because they've been stuck for a long period of time. So what is your policies for that? And it'd be great to have conversations with both sides once they've kind of winnowed that out, but also from both sides when the Republicans have their primaries and the Democrats are having theirs. So you can sort through which is the representative you want from you know, your particular flavor, but then when they're out there, and when you have one or debate or two debates, I don't think it really gets to that. I think the more that you can get in front of the American people and those opportunities, I think it's better because then the American citizens can make an informed decision. And it really gets to see the make of the person that you actually would put in the highest office of the land. So, Great. Good question. Thanks. Okay, back there, Will. Just wondering, considering the Dominion lawsuit was settled, uh, what do you think the public is losing for not getting to see that testimony? You have a good answer. You, you have a well, great answer on this, actually, Brad. Well, already, before it even got there, though, the, the, a lot of the, the depositions that Brad, were made. Just, just a second. But could everybody hear the, that question? Uh, okay. okay. Let me just, uh, so I think the question was, what has been lost by the fact there was a settlement in the Dominion Fox lawsuit, Correct. meaning the testimony won't ever now be heard? Correct. And so in that settlement, the Fox News Corporation has agreed to pay 787 point five million dollars you know to dominion and so that's been settled but we already know that there was you know facts made you know findings of fact you know in the case so that is actually settled law because once the judge said these are the findings of facts fox did not dispute them that's right. and so that means those are the findings of fact and so you can look at the depositions they'll be out there they're public record that's not been sealed and then now dominion's been out there talking about it so you know what the truth is and the truth is, is that those machines actually recorded everyone's vote. That's the right. truth is the machines did not flip the votes. That's right. So the truth is those were the results in the states that used those machines. Now, Dominion was not used in everywhere, but I think one of the reasons we got focused in on is that 100% of our counties used Dominion machines, and we were obviously a bellwether state. You know, we were a swing state. So that really had two issues going on there. New Mexico uses Dominion also. So that was, it was just a, a way to, kind of focus in and scapegoat one company. That's right. But it is there, it's been settled, and we just hope that the information gets out. And we know it'll get out on CNN and MSNBC. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I don't know if uh, Sean Hannity and Tucker Carlson will be carrying that tonight. They were, ta they were talking about the garage collapse in Lower <laughs> Manhattan. That was clearly the, 
the, the big news of the day. Well, as a structural engineer, I was very interested in that. <laughs> and, there was, and there was actually one in uh, Savannah, a third floor of a courthouse, and that interests me too. You didn't work on that. No, no, the one was an old building, but uh, we do structural upgrading too, so. Uh. <laughs> come, come, come to a second, but I, I brushed past one thing. Yeah, uh, Heidi, you want to bring it up here? Um, we talked about Dominion voting machines, and you both said earlier that you both use them, both states. It didn't sound like you've hesitated at all about continuing to use Dominion voting machines. Am I right? Correct. Not at all. Yeah. And and we, you know, for for almost a decade, when I when I was starting out as an election official, we had a different system in mm. New Mexico, and it was just it was problematic. We, you know, just a challenge to use a challenge. Not that they not that they didn't count votes correctly, but they were just frankly, wonky machines that didn't yeah. work very well. And Dominion, the Dominion machines have been excellent. And, and the company has so been So neither excellent. of you has wavered in no. the two. Okay. No. no. I think that's one of the challenges that we have is someone starts taking shots and people start buckling. It's, yeah. no, yeah. a, a couple of years ago, a man right. re, uh, coming out of a place for lunch, he just kind of, hey, Brad, yes, yeah, yeah. I like your gumption. And I hadn't heard that <laughs> word for, for a long, long time. <laughs> but it's not like I'm trying to pick battles with anyone, but. Right. You know, I know the law, I know the facts. If the machines weren't accurate, then I would say, That's oh, right. we made a mistake. No, the machines were accurate. We did a forensic audit of the machines, mm. and the results were the results. Yeah. I think I'll just stay sitting. I think your gumption was great as well. <laughs> um, what can we do to make sure that we have correct, factual information coming to the people of the United States as we have seen the use of sophisticated propaganda techniques in the last administration, whose name I don't want to say. I'll, I'll, I'll invoke uh, you know, something Brad said earlier. Um, you all can help with that. Um, you know, I think we, you know, whether we're very active or very, you know, not very active in social media, but it's not just social media, it's also talking to our friends, our neighbors, our family, right? Pushing back, we, we were having this discussion with the students earlier, um, you know, it, it's, we are in a trust but verify, right, kind of world where, you know, if, if you see information that's too good to be true or too bad to be true, it probably isn't true. Right, and so I think, you know, even for myself, right, I, I always need to make sure that I, if I see a headline or something and I read, you know, a single article about something, I think, okay, this sounds really bad, or hey, this sounds really good. I'm gonna double check this a little bit more because before I start sharing that, uh, espousing my own opinion on it, um, making sure other folks sort of see the same thing. I wanna make sure that what I am sharing and talking about and thinking about is accurate. I have to check my own biases and my own sort of core value beliefs before I start, you know, putting something out there. And I think that's just, that, that's a hard thing for us to learn how to do, to just stop and go, hmm, is this completely accurate? But we all, we all of us that are doing any sort of you know, discourse on social media or even just with our, our friends and family members and relatives, that's something we all need to, to work on and get a little bit better at, I think. I think, uh, I think everyone should read probably a couple different newspapers. You don't have to read every single article, but uh, I tend to read our local newspaper, Wall Street Journal, and I think that kind of balances out. I know that I'm going to, you know, get a, a business perspective, maybe a conservative perspective, our local pr newspaper. If you're going to listen to uh, radio, if you got serious on your car, you know, if you put on Fox News, great. Put on CNN, great. And a little bit of both. And then throw in a little bit of Bloomberg so you can watch what the markets are doing to your 401k. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but I, I think it's to really balance it. My dad just brought us up to, he says, Brad, you can't believe anything you read in the newspaper. Read between the lines. Come up, you know, you got to think for yourself. And so we were always taught to be independent thinkers in our family. And, and so we had a bipartisan upbringing. And, you know, I, I, one of my sisters, she's like me, and I have another sister that, you know, she's on the other side of the aisle. But families are like that, but it's okay. It's just people come to different conclusions, but know the facts and then draw your own conclusions. Um, uh, so I think we've got time for two more questions. Why don't we do Will back there, and then Heidi, we'll finish up here. 
after the 16 and 20 presidential elections, there were questions raised about the, uh, the viability of the electoral college system and whether or not we should change that. Since both of you, since that would require a constitutional amendment, it would be very tedious. Since both of you are uh, election officials in your respective states and have your finger on the pulse, so to speak, of the, of the states, both legislators and people, is that something that is going to come up uh, in, in the future? I don't, I don't foresee in the near or middle term future um, an amendment to the Constitution. There is the National Popular uh, Vote Compact, uh, Initiative and Compact, that uh, I believe is maybe one or two states away from going into effect. My state is a, is a member um, uh, as of about, I want to say, 10 years ago or so. And what that would do is basically, because the states determine how they allocate their electoral college votes, um, that they agree, it, those who are members of the compact, uh, once it goes into effect, once there's an, um, uh, enough states with enough electoral votes, that they would agree to allocate their uh, state's electoral college votes to the popular vote winner, national popular vote winner. I don't know if that is likely to be, uh, to get this, all the states it needs in the near future. That's what I know. What about the possibility of states taking it upon themselves to do what Nebraska does, for example, and apportion delegates by congressional district as opposed to winner take all statewide? Seem plausible? I think that's more likely to happen in the near future. I don't know. I don't believe it'll happen in Georgia, but right. uh, the power that the federal government uh, doesn't have is reserved to the states, okay. so that's a state's decision. Uh, but I'm very cautious before tinkering with the Constitution. And the advantage of the Electoral College is that you really then have to run a national campaign. You just don't have to run one in all the big cities. And in Georgia, we do have a rural versus urban you know, separation and a lot of angst that you get that. They, people in the rural areas don't feel like they have a voice. Well, just imagine when you have states that feel like they don't have a voice. It's just not healthy for the country. And so I think when you have to run a statewide campaign, and all of a sudden, so Ohio used to be you know, a bellwether state. Well, now it's Republican, and now we are. We're getting a lot of love. They're coming to Georgia now, <laughs> spending their money, but they're, they're trying to win. But I think that's really healthy that you have people running nationwide because you want to be the president of the entire nation for all the people, even though you may have your particular leaning. But that's really important. People want to feel that they're being heard, that their voice matters. Okay. Good point. Last question. This is back to the question about uh, how to deal with uh, intimidation of election workers. And you both mentioned that uh, penalties for that have been increased. But I'm wondering, were there any convictions un under the law that existed in 2020 for the many examples of voter in or election worker intimidation that happened then? So like, you know, if you increase the penalties, it doesn't matter if nobody gets convicted. That's, <laughs> That's right. where I'm coming yeah. from on that. My understanding is, so since 2020, there has been a federal FBI DOJ task force that's been put together that is charged with, you know, sort of collecting the data on, on these instances uh, and initiating prosecutions where appropriate. And my understanding is it's been pretty slow going. I think at our conference last summer, they said they had something like six, six active prosecutions going on. So it's taking time because it, this is like an emerging issue, right? Um, that they really haven't grappled with before um, and, and that frankly our states haven't really, I mean, when have you ever heard about, you know, except in very rare instances, you know, poll workers or election officials being threatened, intimidated and harassed, you know, it's this, this is a new issue. So I, I am hopeful that we will be seeing some prosecutions coming out of that. It's just, it seems to be taking a while. So, yeah. Any, any, did anybody raise the possibility with you in Georgia, for example, post 2020 of prosecuting people for intimidation? Uh, it's not happened in Georgia, but what we've had is civil lawsuits, you know, coming out of that. And uh, one of those was Ruby Freeman for defamation, actually. Uh, and mm -hmm. they got one settlement already. And perhaps when you hit them in people in the pocketbook, that's the best way to stop right. some of that. But it is like, you know, Maggie was saying, it's an emergency, emerging issue. And so now 
the, the challenge that you have is the legal cycle is always going to be slower right. than the political cycle. The political cycle works on every 24 hours. <laughs> the legal cycle, it took, not, it took Dominion not here. Takes, not, it's not gonna, it doesn't last that long anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As, when I Three started. tweets and you're done. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, yeah. Exactly. Right. Got it. Um, well, listen, I, you know, I asked a question earlier about whether uh, our friends here, uh, Maggie and Brad, are optimistic or pessimistic. And I got to say that having this conversation with them makes me more optimistic. So thank you both for doing that and for <laughs> showing us the way. Thank you. Um, and and thank, thank, thank you all for being here, because I think to Brad's point, when people show up, it shows that they're going to take an active part, and that's, that's part right. of the answer to all these problems. I, I would just note that next week, there's an interesting event here at the Institute on April 25th. Uh, the Dole Lecture with Senators Trent Lott and Tom Daschle uh, will be in, here in partnership and in true bipartisan That'd spirit, cool. um, and I hope people can make it out for that as well. Uh, meanwhile, uh, enjoy the windy evening out there, and thanks <laughs> for coming up, and thanks again to you both. Thank you. <laughs> that was really great. Thank you. 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 Thank you.